Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 1. And 2 Kings, it's a time of upheaval in Israel, about uh, 900 B.C. And this deals with the collapse of the northern kingdom of Israel, because it's divided at this point, and the southern kingdom of Judah. And if we back up just uh, to the previous chapter, of uh, last chapter of 1 Kings, I want to read verses 51 to 53. It says, because uh, it doesn't end well at, at chapters at 1 Kings. 1 Kings ends with, Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, the 17th day of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And he reigned two years over Israel. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father, in the way of his mother, and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. For he served Baal and worshipped him, provoked to anger the Lord God of Israel, according to all that his father had done. So we see a failure in the, these kings at this point of time, and uh, perhaps you have that, that sheet that I printed out with all the kings uh, of Israel, uh, the good and the bad. And uh, so we see the failure of the leadership here of the kings to lead the nation in a godly manner. And that's what God wants. Verse 1 of Second Kings. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and, and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go, inquire of Beelzebub, the king of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meeting the messengers of the king of Samaria, Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but thou shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. So we hear that Ahaziah fell uh, through the lattice here. We don't know what happened, if he was unsteady, if he was drunk. We, we don't know. But uh, we do know that he didn't go to the true Lord for help. Uh, he sends an oracle or a, 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 a pagan uh, worshiper, which is a direct insult to Jehovah God. And uh, this is, uh, we, we're going to see Elijah now, in one of his, he's in one of his last missions here. And uh, this question, is there a God in Israel, can be seen in different ways. It, it could be simply, is there a God in Israel? Or has God left the nation Israel? Is there a God, but he's left Israel? And, and, it, and is this why you're seeking this pagan God? Because the real God is no longer available to you? Because you've rebuffed him and pushed him away? Or because Israel's God has left Israel? And God doesn't leave a nation for no reason. I like what, the, of course, they didn't have the New Testament, but James 4, 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So has the nation of Israel left God? Is this why they're seeking a, a pagan God? Is uh, He's basically saying, is your hardness of heart responsible because you won't return? Not so much because you don't return. Are you forced? Are you choosing, isn't it because you've left him behind because of your actions that you won't recover here? And, uh, of course, we need to be careful where we go for counsel also, because here, here they are reaching out to a, a pagan uh, prophet here, asking for leadership leading from a pagan god. Psalm 33.10 says, The Lord brings the counsel of the heathen to nothing, to naught. He makes the devices of the people of none effect. And, and verse 11 says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Verse 5, as we move on through this chapter, And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said to them, Why are you now turned back? And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you send to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? 
Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but thou shalt surely die. So Ahaziah's answer here comes. Um, he, he's mortally wounded, physically because he fell through the lattice here, but also spiritually. He's just fallen away from God. And he's saying he won't recover. And the reason here, because he and Israel have rejected God. In verse 7, he said to them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was a hairy guy. He was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. Sounds like John the Baptist. And he said, It is Elijah, the Tishbite. So he has this physical description here of Elijah. He's got a lot of hair on his head. He's got a lot of hair on his body and hair on his face. Uh, he wore this rough leather garment as, as a, actually a symbol of repentance. And that's, we see that sometimes through different priesthoods where they wear rough robes or rough things that rub against the skin to show that they're repenting. And, uh, and some people say today that we have to learn to get along with everyone. God's word doesn't say that. God's word says there are some people we can't get along with. Matthew 10:33, Jesus is speaking. He says, "Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven." Think not that I'm come to send peace on earth; I'm come not to send peace, but a sword. Isn't that strange. For I'm come to set a man at variance against his father, and the father against her mother, and the father-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a mother and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. And if you don't be, believe this, and so watch what happens when one person in a large family gets saved and tries to share that with the rest of the family. You get this fighting within. No, <laughs> some will give, some will say, "Oh yeah, I get that." Others will say, "No." And we know that when the church compromises with the world, when the church compromises with the world, the world doesn't listen. The world compromises the church. When you have someone who's in the pulpit, for example, just teaching stories and and, uh, feel-good messages, it's not the Word of God. And it's the Word of God that changes hearts. In verse 8, When the king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50, and he went... (coughs) Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty, and he sent up to him, or he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill. And he spoke to him, <clears throat> Thou man of God, the king has said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of the fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him. And his 50. So 51 men here feel the fire of judgment from the Lord. Verses 11 and 12. Again also he sent unto him another captain of 50 with his 50. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto him, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Now suppose you were the next captain in in line. You had fifty guys with you. And you just saw what had happened. Uh, I'm next. (laughs) (laughs) So we have another fifty-one men who feel the fire of judgment. Verse 13, and he sent again a captain of the of the third 50 with his 50. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50 thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire down from heaven and and burned up the two captains of the former 50s with their 50s. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. So here's one of these soldiers. Now this cap, he asked for mercy. God extends it. He asked that he see that God would see their lives as precious. And God does see life as precious. First <clears throat> John one nine says that if we confess our sins 
God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's all he asks is that we confess. Moving on to verse 16 now. And the Lord said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beals above the God of Ekron, is it not because there is no God in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. So he died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. And, Je and Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So here we see Elijah, he's repeating God's judgment on Ahaziah. God's word doesn't change. Even if it comes a little later, it's still God's word. It doesn't change. And the account's a little confusing here because the king of Judah at that time was also named Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoram, the son of Ahab, back in, here in Second Kings, uh, we'll see that a little later in chapter 3, the brother of Ahaziah. Ahaziah didn't have a son to pass the kingdom to, so the throne went to his brother. And this ends the line of Amri and, Amri and his son Ahab, maybe Ahab and Jezebel. In chapter 2 now, we see here the, the end of what you might, you might say the end of Elijah's life. Because he gets translated now and into heaven on this chariot of fire. And we see the rise of the one prophet who was to come behind him, Elisha, not Elijah. And he uh, was first heard of in 1 Kings chapter 19. In verse, let's look at verse 1 of chapter 2 here. And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Gil Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy son soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel uh, came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from, the head to the, from thy head today? And he said, Yeah, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee. For the Lord has sent me to Jericho, and he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And by the way, this, this town of Bethel, Beth means house of. El is a, the, a short name for God, so it's house of God. Elijah wants Elisha to stay back. Elisha wants to be there <laughs> when Elijah is taken. Verse 5, And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he announced, Yeah, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle, which is a wrap, and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. So uh, Moses wasn't the only one you know, that, that got the waters to part. Um, so we have others advising in all of this, prophets and fortune tellers and uh, zodiac people and uh, the occult. And in today's world, we see all kinds of people turning anywhere but for, to God for help. And uh, in, in this case, where we are in Scripture right now, they couldn't tell Elisha anything he didn't already know. And the Lord parted the Jordan River for Joshua and the Jews 500 years earlier in Joshua chapter 3. And now he repeats this miracle again for Elijah and Elisha uh, parting the waters of the Jordan. Verse 9, And it came to pass uh, when they were gone over that Elijah, Elijah said unto Elisha, 
Ask what I shall do for thee for before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now, this is what you'd call a grand exit. Okay, He's, uh, uh, Elijah makes this grand exit, uh, one of two, uh, uh, and he goes, he goes straight to heaven. His body doesn't die. God just takes him. It's, I think this is a, a kind of a precursor or an idea of the rapture where we get taken up while we're still here on this earth. In Genesis 5.24, uh, there was another one. It says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So Enoch, he was walking along one day, and God just went, you're out of here. Hebrews 11.5 addresses this. Uh, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So whether you call it translation, transforming, transformation, God took him. And uh, verse 9, the, uh, Elisha asks here that a double portion of, of his spirit, Elijah's spirit, be upon him. Some people would misinterpret this as being vain. It's not vanity here. It's not self-promotion. It's not ambition. He's not asking for this to be greater than his master, but he has an eagerness to promote God's glory and to be powerful before the Lord. And, and we, when we pray for a whole filling of the Holy Spirit, it's to do God's work, not to promote ourselves within the body of Christ. And it's the same here with Elijah or Elisha. Verse 12, and Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of, chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. In other words, Elisha's gone. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elisha that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over. So uh, Elijah, Elisha has taken Elijah's uh, place, takes his robe, hits the water with it. The water parts just like uh, the Red Sea, but this is the Jordan, a little smaller at this point. And... Uh, so some would ask, well, is the power in the robe, or is the power in Elijah, or is it in the power in Elisha? Well, none of those. The power is in God. He's working through him, but God's the one with the power. And Elijah knew it. Elisha knew it. And uh, in verse 14, he says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? It's, that was an important <laughs> question then. It's an important question today. Why look to mankind in this program when we have the Lord? We can look to the Lord God of Israel and the true and the living God, and we have his book. Verse 15, and when the sons of the prophets, and when the sons in, uh, of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him, and he bowed and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And, and they said unto him, Behold now, there be with thy saints fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master, lest peradventure the spirit of the Lord hath taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not send. And when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, Send. Okay, send. And they sent forth 50 men, and they sought three days, but found him not. In other words, let me take 50 days and go look for him, for Elisha, see if he's up there. But no, he's gone to be with the Lord. No, let us go look anyway. Okay, go ahead. So they looked three days. No. Nope. When they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he said to them, Did I not say to you, go not? So we have some of uh, the devil's theology students here uh, watching all of this in Elijah. Uh, leaving and Elisha's uh, parting the waters. 
and, and they didn't really believe that Elijah had gone up all, all, all the way up to be with God. And they thought, well, maybe he got dumped in the wilderness out there somewhere. Maybe the chariot went, it didn't make it all the way into heaven. It just went part way. And so they sent 50 men to find him. And they didn't find him. When they came back, Elisha said, basically, told you so. <laughs> what an odd way, idea they have of God's ways that he would take Elijah home and yet drop him off along the way. And uh, a lot of people still have uh, uh, wrong ideas about God, that God's up in heaven just watching and waiting for us to sin so he can go, zap, I'm going to mess up your life, zap, you messed up again. He's more gracious than that. It's kind of like talking about God of the backhand, that he's up there to smack us every time we make mistakes. He's not. He's the God of the open hand. He gives. He's a loving giver. And we know that uh, all roads lead to him. And um, some people think like the Star Wars, that he's an impersonal force that you can tie into. He's not. Uh, verse 19. I'm going to see another miracle. And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not in the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth into the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were, waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spoke. So Jericho's waters were bad, apparently. The, the ground was barren. The fruit trees were barren. They weren't bearing fruit. That also means that the, the animals and the women were not bearing fruit, and they were losing babies. And the Lord healed, used salt to heal the water, and made the water sweet again, and things turned around. Verse 23 and he went up from thence unto Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the woods and tore forty and two children of them. And he went from thence to Mount Carmel, and from thence he returned to Samaria. Seems like a brutal act from the Lord to send out a bear to kill all these kids, to tear them up. Uh, the word little children here is misinterpreted and misunderstood in the English. It really meant people in the 30 to 4 year old range, apparently. Um, educated at the Bethel School for Prophets, they're rebellious against the Lord. Uh, they're, they were taught to be godless. And some Jewish scholars say children because they don't, they didn't follow God's commandments, uh, little because they were of little faith. Not sure. But we can, re we can be thankful that God has revealed himself to us through his creation, through his laws. Uh, they're actually written on our hearts through his word in the Bible, through Jesus Christ, who is the word of God. God has revealed himself in a lot of ways so that according to chapter 1 of Romans, that we're without excuse. There's no excuse not to believe in God. All we have to do is look around us. Chapter 3, now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over, the, over Israel in Samaria the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned 12 years. And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother, for he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. <clears throat> so dealing here with the reign of Jehoram, Ahab and Jezebel's son over Israel, reign of Jehoshaphat, Asa's son over Judah, <clears throat> he says that Jehoram is not like his parents. What he did was he put away the sins of his father because they worshipped the image of Baal, the untrue God. What, what he didn't do is he didn't put away the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. The sins of Jeroboam, what was that? He, the, it was calf worship. In 1 Kings chapter 12, going back in 1 Kings, verse 32 says, Jeroboam ordained a fe feast in the 8th month, 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. 
and he offered upon the altar. So he did in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made, and he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. Now we move on to verse 4. And Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep master, and rendered unto the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams with the wool. And it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So Moab, Moab at this point is in subjection to Israel, but the, and they pay to Israel a tribute. A hundred thousand sheep, a hundred thousand rams, with all the wool that goes along with that. And uh, they rebel against Israel after Ahab's death, refusing to pay that tribute that they had promised. In King, verse 6, King Jehoram <coughs> And went out in, of Samaria the same time and numbered all Israel, means he gathered them together. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art. My people is thy people, and my horses as thy horses. And he said, Which way shall we go up? And he answered, The way through the wilderness of Edom. So, Jehoram is gathering Israel for war. Israel's divided. They're still Jews. They're still the same people. But uh, they're also united with them because he had to cross their land uh, to attack Moab. They needed to be allies, uh, Judah and Israel. And uh, times of trouble will often unite people who are divided over other issues. And this is the case, one of those cases. Verse 9 so the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the days, and, and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days' journey. And there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here's Elijah, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. So as the army is headed for Moab now, they don't find water along the way. And they're, they're in danger of ending this campaign against Moab in danger of being comp conquered even by the Moabites. And Jehoshaphat apparently is the God-fearing man, and he calls for a, a prophet, a real prophet of God for direction. But he didn't do this first when he had formed a, 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 an alliance with an ungodly man. Hmm. That can sometimes be our way to pray and seek the Lord after we're in trouble, <laughs> after we stumbled in our own wisdom. Uh, there's a saying is, uh, when, uh, when you're up to your armpits and alligators, it's hard to remember that your initial plan was to drain the swamp. <laughs> you know, so sometimes we get so deep into a thing, we go, oh, it's too late to back out now. Verse 13, And Elisha said to the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. So uh, Elijah speaks pretty boldly here. He says, uh, Go back to your godless gods. And he refuses uh, uh, he refuses to recognize them, but they refuse to recognize the true God. And uh, we should be dealing ruthlessly with sin in our own lives. And uh, uh, Galatians 5.24 says, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. That means we, uh, we should deal as if we're crucified, because dead people don't sin <laughs> when we're, when we're uh, crucified in Christ, truly. Verse 15. But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him, and he said, Thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. 
For thus saith the Lord, you shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water that you may drink, both you and your cattle and your beasts. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand, and he shall smite every fenced city and every choice city, and shall fell every good tree and stop all wells of water and mar every good piece of land with stones. So uh, God's promising a total victory over the war and, and, and the water. And he says, there's so much water coming, uh, you're going to have to dig ditches just to hold it. And in verse 20, as it as it came to pass, and it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered, that behold, there came water by way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. And when all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood on the border. And they rose up early in the morning, and the sun shone upon the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, This is blood. The kings are surely slain, and they have smitten one another. Now therefore, Moab, to the spoil. So, thinking that Israel was fighting one another, they saw blood filled with water. They figured, now I can go in and take a, take everything. And they go running in expecting uh, no enemy. It made them easy prey for Israel. Sometimes we can be tempted to do that, to go in somewhere undefended, thinking there's no enemy. The devil, the devil loves it when we don't believe in him or when we don't believe he's there. Uh, let's read to the end of the chapter, verse 24 through 27. And when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them. And they, when they, when they, But they went forward, smiting the Moabites even in their country. And they beat down the cities and on every good piece of land cast every man his stone and filled it. And they stopped all the wells of water and felled all the good trees only in uh, Kirharaseth uh, left they the stones thereof. Howbeit the slingers went about it and smote it. And when the, uh, when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him 700 uh, men that drew swords to break through even unto the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was a great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him, from him and returned to their own land. Now, human sacrifice was practiced by the Moabites. So here we see the king of Moab, in order to get a victory to his God, he sacrifices his son as a burnt offering to this Moabite god uh, Chemosh, hoping that that god would spare him from his enemy. Well, in one way you could say it worked. The, the Jews went home disgusted, totally disgusted with that. And the king of Moab was very sincere that this would work. Sincere, but wrong. You know, sincerity isn't a reason to believe someone. Many people do what is sincerely wrong. There was a bishop a little over a century ago that stood in his pulpit and pronounced that uh, heavier-than-air flight was impossible and contrary to the will of God. And you think about the irony of Bishop Wright. He had two sons, Orville and Wilbur Wright. Wright was wrong. <laughs> he was sincerely sure of himself, but he was wrong. Sincerity doesn't make something right. Check it out in the Word of God. That's all I have to say. Let's pray. Lord, Lord uh, oh, so many people are sincere about what they're doing in their lies, and uh, they think they're thinking the truth, and they're not. And, Lord, thank you that we have a book that we can hold things up to. I thank you, Lord, for those schools that are discipling young women and young men, uh, such as Patrick Henry uh, University, Lord, and, and such, that just disciple young men and women to be leaders uh, of a, in a godly way. Lord. So help us, Lord, when we encounter, whether it be family members or strangers, any way we can lead and disciple in, to behavior in a godly way, Lord, and not in the flesh. So be with us this night, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.